What's up guys, CP Modder here, back with another video. Now recently I was digging through the bin pile of old PC parts in my shelf over there and I went ahead and was needing to put together an old system and I dug up this old relic. A first generation original Intel Core i3 CPU equipped system with its original Intel motherboard, original stock Intel cooler and this guy was released back in Q2 of 2010. That's eight years ago and about just under three quarters of a year which is it's kind of crazy to think that such an old system has been sitting on my shelf for quite some time. Now I also to notice that that CPU cooler had never been removed from the system, meaning it's the original box CPU cooler, original thermal paste, and everything really hasn't been touched. Don't get me wrong, I did blow off all the dust when it first came into my um, shelf, but otherwise I really haven't touched it, so it's been quite some time since it's ever been touched. In fact. It's never been touched. Now the reason why I built this system, which you can find up in that video or over on the channel where we went ahead and built a system from the bin pile, was essentially to go ahead and have a system that I could throw together, as you can see over my shoulder, that wasn't exactly too expensive. Now, over here on the channel, I do have plans to test out some, well, cheaper hardware that you find on the internet. And the last thing that I wanna go ahead and do is blow up my $6,000, $7,000 computer with like a $20 stick of RAM that I found on eBay that may or may not work. So I'd much rather blow up something that's like super old than something that's super expensive. So that's why I was putting together this system. But then along from doing that, I also do thought about and thought, well, how bad is eight-year-old thermal paste? Now, in the past, we've done a number of videos where we compared thermal paste. Uh, most recently, we did a comparison where we covered up to five years old, but I've never had something that was eight years old. So today, we're gonna be putting that to the test. So if you do wanna know more again about this particular system, why I built it, what are the specs, and all those type of things, you can find the video over the channel. But today, we are more focusing on this guy over my shoulder. Now, yeah, it's really not the greatest in terms of cable management or anything like that, but essentially the idea is if it blows up, pff, who really cares? So that's why not too much time and effort was actually put into it. So again, if you do want to know more, check out that video there. So the plan today is actually really simple. Grab some thermal paste and put it on, right? Well, Actually, yeah, for once, that is actually the right kind of test. However, one thing that I did also to notice whilst looking at this thing is the stock inbox cooler from Intel really hasn't changed that much over the years, but it has changed slightly. So whilst we do these tests, I also do want to run a number of other tests to see how much the actual stock inbox cooler has changed. Because really, since the introduction of 1150X, we haven't seen that much of a difference in terms of the stock inbox cooler we get. And really, if we're going to be honest, we haven't seen that much of a difference even back from 775. Going from 775 to 1150X basically was the same cooler, just a little bit different mounting hardware to match up the newer CPUs. So uh, yeah, the actual cooling other than the stickers hasn't really changed that much. But before we do get into the actual benchmarks of this system, let's take a look at the Intel Core i3 550. So again, this guy launched back in Q2 of 2010 and this guy itself was actually purchased around Q3 2010. So it is about eight years old. It features a 2.2 gigahertz speed, 4 megs of cache, 73 watt TDP, and is based on the 32 nanometer Clarkdale architecture, which by today's standards Oof, it's quite old. It also too supports a maximum 16 gigabytes of DDR3 RAM in dual channel mode. However, you'll also to note that eight gigabyte DIMMs don't exactly work properly with them. You need some other special stuff to go with it. So it's meant to be four by four in terms of 16 gigs. Uh, in terms of the actual onboard graphics, this is where things get really old school, being obviously the first generation. Intel's Arc page just lists, lists them as uh, legacy applications, uh, GPUs, and then uh, CPU-Z doesn't really come back with anything. But we do know for a fact it is running at 733 megahertz, which again, isn't really blowing anything away by today's standards. Sure, don't get me wrong, you can run a HD screen off this guy and you can play back a HD video, but as we'll see in the benchmarks, it's really not pushing anything hard. For those interested in PCI Express connectivity, we get a PCI Express 2.0 support on this thing with a maximum of 16 lanes, which is kind of crazy to think because, well, in just eight years, we've been able to 4X that rating and go up to 64 PCI lanes on the latest Threadripper chips, which is kind of crazy to think in just eight years, we have 4 x the PCI Express connectivity of our chips and like insanely x amount the actual cores and processing power. So kind of cool to take a look at such an old system. 
So for the rest of the system that we did paired up, obviously using the stock cooler, I threw a copy of Windows 10 on an SSD because let's face it, we needed something to run it on and we started up our test. So jumping in, we grabbed the original cooler and the visual setup, just hit go on our Prime 95 test, left it for half an hour as each of the tests were done and obviously a half an hour cooldown period as well to make sure everything was even throughout all our tests. And well, we do get these numbers here. As expected, it's a little bit warmer as we do need to remember that this is still based on the 32 nanometer process, so it is going to be a little bit bigger, a little bit warmer than what you might be expecting. And also too, we do need to remember that this is coming from a period where CPUs were still known for exploding, so that was still kind of a thing. Swapping out the thermal paste, just the thermal paste to Arctic MX4, which is a nice little upgrade right here, we saw a really big difference. As we can see in our numbers, we went from 85 degrees Celsius on the hottest core down to 69 degrees Celsius on the hottest core. That's a 16 Celsius drop between the two different tests and the only thing I did between them was switch out the thermal paste to Arctic MX4 which is a pretty well trusted thermal paste that I use in just about all the systems now that I own and is really really great. Now if we also do factor in a new cooler that has not only a newer and more efficient fan and doesn't sound like a truck driving down the road it also too features a copper slug. So the actual i3 that we have right here shipped with an all aluminium inbox cooler and this is the same for a lot of our more modern CPUs, a lot of i3s and Pentiums and stuff do come out with what looks to be standard Intel box coolers but actually don't feature a copper slug in the middle. So if we take a look right here, we see that a lot of new generations such as the 8th generation, i7s and i5s all feature a copper slug in the middle of their CPU cooler. And this is there to help dissipate some of the heat as we all do know that copper is a much better material for transferring heat and that's what we threw in for our second set of tests and... Well, we didn't exactly see an overall temperature drop. Overall temperature again did remain the same. However, one thing that didn't show up in our numbers was the actual recovery time of the CPU cooler itself. So when we hit it with Prime 95 and there was max load and everything was at that 60 to 70 degrees range, and then we took that load off, the time it took to get back down to its general idling temperature was a lot better with the copper equipped uh, CPU cooler than without the copper equipped CPU cooler, which was a really nice little bonus there. Again, sure, overall temperatures didn't change, but the fact that it was able to recover a lot faster was something that was really helpful. Especially if you're up in the really high temperatures close to TJ Maxx, this can be a really major help, especially if you're doing stuff like video gaming where the load on the CPU may not necessarily be constant. So if you're getting little spikes here and there that would cause your CPU to thermal throttle, if you were to feature a copper equipped uh, CPU cooler, what it could do is every time there was a drop, it would recover much faster so you could be back in that boost for a lot longer, in theory anyway. So the actual test that we did run here today uh, did show a decent improvement when we did switch out the thermal paste. Overall performance though wasn't again affected by the actual temperatures mainly because we weren't actually thermal throttling and if we take a look at our benchmarks well other than it being comically low for us here in 2018 it does show up that it did actually well stay the same whether we had the old thermal paste or the new one on our old system. Again mainly because we weren't thermal throttling and didn't have any thermal issues here. We just noticed a temperature drop. Oh and also too, uh, one funny thing about this actual thermal paste on this guy, it is so old and so dried up that I can run my finger over this guy and get nothing on my finger itself. If this was even just our five-year-old thermal paste, uh, this thing would be all over my fingers and I would have made quite a mess. But in fact, this thing is so dry, I can run my finger on it and nothing actually comes off, which is absolutely crazy to think. And it's kind of turned into like a dry sand consistency, to be honest. When I took it off the actual CPU, crumbles of it fell off and that was a little bit of a concern because it really shouldn't be doing that if it is thermal paste. So TLDR time for this video. Even though it is a rather short video, 8 year old thermal paste is definitely not going to be performing great at all. Inside of the vacuum, sure it wasn't overheating, however when we compared it to some good quality thermal paste like Arctic MX4 that we used here today, we actually saw a massive difference. For those of you out there running an older system for just $9 for a stick of Arctic MX4, you can see a 16 degrees decrease over the old thermal paste. And if you were to upgrade the CPU cooler from an all aluminium one to a aluminium and copper cooler, you could not only see a lower temperature, but also to reduced cooldown times, which is exactly what you want to see on your system. Whether you're running just an older system for office tasks, or you're running a first or second gen Intel uh, i7 or i5, or even an AMD chip, there's a lot that can be benefited from just simply switching over the thermal paste from something that's 
completely dried up to something that's obviously wet and still going to be making a difference. If your temps are up in the 90s on an old computer, this is definitely going to be a major help helping you to claw back some performance and really $9, it's an absolute no brainer, at least on my half. So with that being said, guys, let me know down in that comment section, what is the biggest gap in performance you've gotten from just simply switching out the thermal pace? I have to say 16 degrees has been one of the biggest gaps I've seen for quite some time, but do let me know how big yours has been down in that comment section. If you want to pick up some Arctic MX4, I'll leave the smaller tube that we used here today and also to the major 20 gram tube link down in that description box because, hey, it's always awesome to have some good quality thermal paste lying around. So do check that description box. Thanks guys for watching and I will catch you all in the next one.